Cashflow Diary Podcast, episode 152. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, and welcome to another episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you guys are here today. You have been here for quite a while, and you know that we are always doing our best to bring many different ways for all of us to go out there and change the way we think about things to go out there and build our cash flow. Because at some point, you want to quote unquote retire, maybe you just want to work a little bit less, or maybe you want to finally get around to doing something that absolutely matters to you, as opposed to something that matters to those that you currently work for. And I think today's guest is going to be able to help you with that because he shares some very, very unique things. I mean, many people, you guys, you send in an email and you say, hey, Jay, how can I, quote unquote, retire early? And what is retirement anyway? And do you even understand the the definition of retirement? And then here's the thing. Today's guest was a former hedge fund manager who managed to retire at age 35, and he loves playing the money game like a kid loves playing Monopoly. Now, for those of you who know me, you know Monopoly and cash flow, those are real estate based and those are things that are absolutely right up my alley. He's now a financial educator and best known for his ability to simplify complex financial subjects without dumbing them down so you know how to make smarter financial decisions. And get this, he's been featured on the Wall Street Journal, Investor Business Daily, Forbes, NPR, Market Watch, and is the author of five books on very different specialty financial topics. One of which I think is a question that you've asked. Have you ever asked yourself, how much money do I need to retire? And that's the title of one of his books. And he's also the host of the Financial Mentor Podcast and gives away a free email course for 52 weeks to financial freedom for you. And we got him. Welcome, Mr. Todd Tresseter. Todd, you there? Thanks for having me, Jay. How are you? Doing good. Good. Glad to hear it. Now, we we might have you at a bit of a disadvantage because everybody knows right now listening, they know the very first question I'm going to ask you because I do it all the time. I look at today's entrepreneurs, you being one of them, a lot like yesterday's superheroes. You know, superheroes, they go around and they save people, you know, Batman, Robin, usually save them from the own mess that they created themselves, dress up in tights and and make people's lives better, supposedly. Now, before they were super, though, they had an alter ego. They started out, you know, maybe they got bit by a spider or took some, you know, pictures for a newspaper. Uh, they were normal people. What we want to know is before the hedge fund manager, before you were out there saving lives and teaching people how to, you know, seven steps to seven figures or all the things that you currently do today, who is Todd Tresser? You know, I was listening to that. And the funny thing is, I don't really have a before because I've been a lifetime entrepreneur. I mean, I've been doing this since I was a little kid. I started this when uh, I had a paper out Got as it. a kid before. I, yeah, before I was even a teenager. And like I used the profits from the paper out to buy a motorcycle so I could get more paper outs and deliver more papers in the same amount of time and jam around on my cool motorcycle. So I, I mean, I've been at this my whole life. It's just who I've been. So I don't really have a before. It's kind of funny. I guess I was teaching sailing and I was doing sailboat racing before that, but that's probably about as before as I can think of. Well, actually, it just means that I'm assuming then you were born into a household where the ideas of entrepreneurship were not only taught, but fostered and encouraged. You couldn't have been more incorrect. I um, I was born into a family... Yeah, it's zero entrepreneurial background. As a matter of fact, the family joke 
my family has never understood me. I've been the freak of my family. <laughs> and the, fa the family joke that goes around is that I work for the CIA and all these little business things I do is just a cover up for my real work. <laughs> okay. All right. This is good. Yeah, so I don't I don't I don't have any family history of entrepreneurial background at all. It's just like I just started doing it. I was into it. Well, I well, you're definitely the first person I've ever heard who took their paper route and then invested in a motorcycle so that they could be more efficient with their paper route. That 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 is a, an efficiency move I've not heard anyone ever make what uh so So that that one is it, it, you, you know what? It was just a sad excuse for a kid to go buy a motorcycle. Well, I was getting ready to say, I'm like, I'm sure that doubled as a way for the, you know, we'll, we'll just say it's it's kind of cool to be the kid with the motorcycle and all the kids want to hang out, and especially the girls. You're like, hey, I got a motorcycle, you know, so I can see the I can see the double purpose there. That could work out very, 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 very well. Um, so go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, as all entrepreneurs do, right? I mean, our businesses serve multiple purposes. Absolutely. At my cell phone is a tax write-off, and it's absolutely necessary that I have the latest one. That's how it works. Um, yep. So, I, and I love that. Here's the Here becomes the question, though. If you are experiencing, because see, there's probably someone out there right now who is trying to be this superhero if you will and they're going through the challenges that you may have faced you know if, if you grow up in this environment you know uh yeah. where entrepreneurship may not be fostered or taught the question becomes is how do you develop the courage to still stick to your guns and and do the things the way that you want to do them because I'm, I'm assuming you met some resistance along the way Oh my gosh. And I don't know if you use the term resistance accidentally or on purpose. Are you familiar with the work by Stephen Pressfield, The War of Art? Nope. Okay. This is a must read for everybody listening to your podcast. He's got two really good books on the subject that I've read. There's a third one too called Do the Work, but he's got two that I've read, which are The War of Art and the other one is Turning Pro. And they're okay. both by Stephen okay. Pressfield. He's the guy that wrote The Legend of Bagger Vance. Oh. And these books were written under the premise of – for the creative type. So like Stephen developed the ideas because he's a writer, a professional writer. It's a storyline of overcoming resistance and he spells resistance with a capital R to deify it, right? Because it's like this internal peace inside all of us as humans and it's that thing that stops us and holds us back whenever we're trying to move our lives forward. And we all have it, me and you included, and so that's when you use the term resistance. I thought, oh, what, he must be clued into that because it's a very specific term. <laughs> well, I'm clued into knowing, to recognizing when I'm feeling it. <laughs> I'm like, hey, I got to fight through these types of things uh, to, to get to that next level. And I'm also hyper familiar with that external resistance that can come from, say, our environment. And I'm just, yeah, I'm like, in my head, I was going, well, if he grew up in an environment where there wasn't support, there had to be significant amounts of resistance. And how on earth did you, how did you deal with that? Um, you know, I just, I just did what was inside of me. Um, it was inside of me and I went for it, but it doesn't mean it's not hard. It's always hard. Uh, as I said, anytime you're trying to move your life forward, it's always a challenge. Like right now for me, I'm developing a, uh, an education program over at my site. Uh, I don't know if you mentioned it, financialmentor.com. And, it's it's really difficult for me. It's a new step forward developing a membership side online program and it's challenging me. And so it's every, you know, it's true for everyone. I don't care how much you've been through this, um, how many stages of growth you've been through. Every time you take yourself to a new level, every time you challenge yourself, you're going to meet resistance. And it takes two forms, as you correctly point out. It's internal and external. The in, But I believe most of the external is a result of the internal. That And you've probably experienced this, Jay, when you are truly committed to something, when you know this is where you're going, you can knock those external points of resistance down pretty effortlessly. I mean, they come up, you knock them down, you overcome them, you just keep running like a hurdler clearing hurdles, right? They're just right. there, but you get through them. And then there's times when you're not really grounded, you don't really know where you're going, and you're not clear and you're not committed, and bam, those hurdles are like sky high. They're like brick walls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. The immovable you, you you can't you can't think of a way over them, around them, under them, through them, and they're the thickest material on the planet. But there's something that I don't I want to make sure people catch because you said and we talk about you having quote unquote retired at age 35. 
We're going to assume that was a little while ago, but yet you're still pursuing additional challenges. So you have a unique perspective on the concept of retirement, and I would love to hear it. Yeah, well, that's a a huge misnomer out there that, you know, retirement is about sitting in a hammock on a tropical beach with a a little umbrella drink, right? And (laughs) And it's not. It's not. I think that there's a myth out there, a really common myth that, you know, we think of life, you're supposed to, you know, work like a dog for 40 years and scrimp and save so you can do nothing of substance for the remaining 30 years. And it's it's not what a fulfilling life is made of. And I've been I've been blessed to live the extremes. So I was a workaholic as I built up the hedge fund business. And then I, as I said, quote unquote, retired. And that was a while ago. You you alluded to it, but I'm it was 18 years ago. And so you know, we sold the business and I was on what I, I call the pro leisure circuit, right? Which is now suddenly <laughs> my my sole focus is entertaining myself. And I was shocked. Um, I always thought that would be joy and happiness. I had that myth in my head. And as soon as I lived it, I realized why so many people are unhappy as they retire. Um, humans are very different. Happiness is a much more subtle thing than we realize. It has to do you know, I'm going to fumble with it a bit because I don't have it down to an exact little one line sentence, but it's, you know, you have to do a creative pursuit that's in alignment with your values mm. that honors some things like contribution, human connection, you know, having a life purpose. All these things are at the core of happiness. And what you find when you quote unquote retire is a lot of that gets removed because a lot of that was vested in your career and how you viewed yourself. And so, I've come back now and I think I'm pursuing something that's closer to balance, which is what, you know, has been dubbed lifestyle business. Right. Um, right. So that to me has been the balance point. Pro leisure circuit was just not so fully satisfying and workaholism has its problems as well. And I think the balance point somewhere in between is, is where I'm finding it. You know, what? what's interesting is uh, I love the uh, reference to the pro leisure circuit. I tried the quote-unquote retirement idea. Uh, I lasted a very, very short period of time because I just got bored. Didn't have, and I was like, I can't do – it's not fun. It's like I got nobody, not enough people to do stuff with. And it's just – I mean, how many times can you keep paying for dinner? Uh, so it it was definitely an interesting thing. But you bring up this concept of <laughs> balance, and I would love – for everybody to, you know, because we we want to start a business because, hey, then I can have more time to myself and I can I can do all these things. I would love to hear your perspective on this concept. In regards to what? Balance? Yeah, balance and what that really means from the entrepreneur's perspective, especially as it relates to the amount of time that it takes to achieve the things that we're talking about. Well, for for me, I'm best. You have to know what works for you. For for me, it uh, it's stint work. So I take off about three months out of the year. I still have kids in school, and so um, I work when the kids are in school. And I work really hard. I mean, while the kids are in school, I can put in the hours and be very focused. And then during the summer months, I take the bulk of the summer off, and then I take the holidays off. And then sometimes I take special time periods off, like, um, what was it, two years ago now, I hiked the John Muir Trail, which is, you know, 250 miles from the base of Yosemite to the peak of Mount Whitney. So, you know, it's just different. Yeah, it's different things. You know, we took a month off and went to Europe as a family and toured around for a month. And so I do different things. um, And that's, that's balance. As long as I can do what I want that's enough for me. And I don't mind hard work when I'm in that work mode. Yeah. Work mode. Indeed. There are times where you got to turn it on as well as turn it off. So talk to us about the beginning in the sense of you're building the, the, the hedge fund and, and there are so many people I'm sure listening to you right now and going, why would he ever stop doing that? Uh, which therefore becomes the, the, I think the jumping off point for a very good conversation is why, why on earth would you stop doing that? Everybody seems to want to be what you were doing. Yeah. It was probably the stupidest financial decision I've ever made. Certainly the most expensive, um, because obviously building a website and financial education business doesn't pay anywhere near what the hedge fund business paid or would have, <laughs> would have paid. So from a financial standpoint, it was absolute insanity, but I, you know, that's not what life is about. 
you, you reach a point, ultimately, you know, the goal is your happiness and you becoming the greatest version of yourself that you can be. It's not about how much money can you amass. And so, you know, I reached a point when I got into the hedge fund business, my fascination was the idea of creating a money machine in the world of paper assets. You know, like how, how could you consistently turn profits in the paper asset world? And that's why I went to the hedge fund side, not like traditional financial advice and that kind of thing. Cause you can't do it there. And so I spent years, my job was researching, um, trading systems. I was one of the early pioneers of computerized trading systems. And so I was programming and developing databases and doing all that stuff. And I tested most of what's out there. And surprisingly, most of it doesn't work. Um, there are a few things that do work. I got to a point where I really understood the principles and got it down to a set of principles. And I got to where it's kind of the 80, 20 rule, you know, like what I had learned in those first 10 years, or I was in the business for 12 years, actually in those first 12 years, what I learned was 80% of the game. I could get 80% of the results for about 20% of the effort. And if I stayed in the business, I could spend the rest of my career trying to figure out how to pick up those last couple percentage points. And I just couldn't see that as a fulfilling way to spend the remainder of my life. Yeah, got it. Totally understood. Now, because, I mean, I'm sure there are many people, like you said, uh, who would have chosen to to stay there definitely for the compensation, but life is definitely a lot more than the compensation. I like what you bring up. You bring the greatest version of yourself that you could be. Um, but you mentioned something really, really quickly. You said... You can't do it with traditional financial advice. That I'm paraphrasing to some degree. You said you can't do it there. Well, could you expound a little bit more? Because there are lots of common misconceptions or things that are out there that you like to talk about that I think everybody needs to hear. Well, in the paper asset world, first of all, paper assets as commonly used as, you know, a buy and hold or passive investment strategy is not really a wealth building vehicle, except over extremely long periods of time. Um, it's really more of a wealth parking vehicle for wealth created elsewhere, which is typically real estate and business. And so with the reason for that is there's mathematical limits to the growth of paper assets. Um, for example, if you take the equation for the, for the return on stocks, it's basically dividends plus economic growth plus or minus change in market valuation. And so the thing about plus or minus change in market valuation, the third component, is that it does what's called regressing to the mean, which over you know, 20, 30-year time periods, it regresses towards zero, which means that your return on a stock portfolio long-term is essentially dividends plus economic growth. And your dividend rate based on your initial invested capital – well, I'm sorry, I, I said that funky. The dividend rate you get is determined by your initial investment, right? The date you invest. So right. if you invest in a low valuation period, you'll get a high dividend rate. If you invest in a high valuation period, you'll get a low dividend rate. They're inversely correlated. Your economic growth is pretty much a constant. And so what that means is that's a really verbose way of saying that there's limits to the the growth of your assets within the paper asset world that are pretty much set in stone. Whereas when you go in business and real estate, you have a couple principles in there that are totally different from the wealth building side. You've got the principles of leverage and the principles of tax advantages. Mm -hmm. And those two principles are why most wealth gets built in those arenas, primarily leverage, but also the tax advantages. Yeah. And uh, those are the things that I've always identified as the <laughs> advantages. Uh, this is definitely to, to paper assets. So uh, one of the things that you mentioned is that, and I like the way you said it, you said paper assets is a wealth parking vehicle. Yet so many uh, individuals, probably even listening right now, are using them on a, you know, bi-weekly or monthly, you know, automatic withdrawal plan straight over to vehicles like a 401k or an IRA. And I I'm just kind of curious, uh, if you were them or individuals in that particular situation, how do they make that work for them? Well, there's the fast path to wealth and there's the slow path to wealth. <laughs> and the faster path, the faster path is riskier. And it's not certain that you'll ever get there because of the risks. And the slower path has a higher probability, a pretty fairly confident outcome, but it takes longer and requires more initial capital. And so a lot of times when I'm working with clients on developing their wealth plan, we try to integrate both. And that way you're pretty much assured of the outcome. So like let's take um, what's common for most people listening is there's a two-partner couple, 
right? Right. And so what you can do is you can have one partner be pursuing the what we'll call the financial stability side, which is they hold a regular job, they get a 401k contribution, and pretty much their income pays the bills and they live within the means of the one income. And then you have the other partner pursue the fast path or the leverage plan, which could be an entrepreneurial pursuit, could be real estate activities on the side, whatever. Um, and so that way, even if the one side, if you properly insulate them in your in how you design it, if the one side fails, you've still got the other side as a backup. Plus, you're never put under financial stress because you're living within your means on the one income. So that's that's one way of structuring it. I, I one thing you'll find unique about me, Jay, is I I'm not. Um, most people you'll talk to are really polar. Like you'll talk to one guy and, and you know, it's all about real estate and the only right. answer is real estate. Right. And the next guy you'll talk to, oh, you know, here's how you do stock options, to become a stock option millionaire. Or another guy you talk about and it's this or that. And, you know, I say, well, they're all valid. What they are is tools. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing right or wrong about any of the individual tools. You just have to understand the principles. You have to use them correctly and you have to integrate them in the plan and they have to be consistent with where you're going and how you're putting it together. Well, and agreed 1,000%. And that's one of the reasons uh, we, we call it cash flow diaries because real estate is one way uh, to get to that particular goal. And there are many different tools out there. And you want to use the best tool for the best job. However, you can't ever choose the correct tool if you don't know where you're going. So I've got to ask you the question. It's also the title of the book. How does someone figure out how much money do they need for retirement. Okay, so that's a <laughs> I like well, the, wait, I like the inhale. Well, wait, he's it, like he's preparing for this one. It's, yeah, I love it. Well, I'm trying to figure out how to answer it because essentially I wrote a book to answer the question, right? Right. You know, how much money do you need to reach higher? I got a whole book on it. And so you give me a question, I'm supposed to land in a sound bite, and I'm like, oh, I don't know how to do that. Um Okay, two sound bites I, then. Well, <laughs> What, okay, so let's first of all go into the subject. Okay, let's just kind of start as an overview of it. If, if you go in and you go to your your friendly broker or your financial planner and say, how much money do I need to retire? What's he going to do? He's going to sit you down across the desk and he, you're going to start inputting a bunch of numbers like what your savings is now. And then he's going to project some assumed rate of return on your assets and how much can you contribute each month. He's going to go through all these questions. You're going to run it through a computer and he's going to come back with a number. Right. Yep. And he's going to set the number down, and it looks all scientific because it ran through a computer, and it's all precise. And guess what? It's all garbage. Um, <laughs> the reason for it is it's that classic garbage in, garbage out equation. If you really understand what's going on behind that equation, and this doesn't matter if you do it with a financial planner. I'm not picking on financial planners. You can do it yourself online using any calculators. And I'm just I have one on my own side. I have a uh, retirement calculator on my own site called the Ultimate Retirement Calculator. And I programmed that just because the way the other ones were working, I couldn't even work with my clients on them. They were so bad. Because when you're doing a wealth plan properly, you have to do what I call scenario analysis, which is your retirement plan or your wealth plan has to reflect your life plan. And so the numbers are merely putting engineering, financial engineering behind what your life plan is. And it's unique to each person because they're bringing different resources, skills, abilities to the equation and so you map those in and you look at where they want to go, what their goals are, and then you integrate that with the numbers to see if you can make the numbers work. So, and so I, but the way well, – go ahead. No, no, no. So uh, if we just take that idea of scenario analysis, you're saying they're bringing different resource skills and abilities to the table. What you're, uh, you're saying is not $100,000 in one person's hands relative to their skill sets and abilities is a different thing than that same $100,000 in someone else's hands or a million dollars or whatever the number is. You're saying yeah. that the what else I know how to do factors greatly into how much I need to retire. Are you tired of letting good cash flow generating ideas go to waste? Go to cashflowdiary.com forward slash ready to apply for a complimentary. Yes, that means free one-on-one -on -one breakthrough session. Take action now. Go to cashflowdiary.com forward slash ready. Again, that's cashflowdiary.com forward slash ready. Before we get back to today's episode of the Cashflow Diary podcast, your host, Jay Massey, has some important insights to share with you. Hey, guys. You know, has your brain exploded yet? If it hasn't, maybe it will in the second half. However, are you learning anything 
that is uniquely different about definitions of retirement, and most importantly, how you might be able to get there faster. I certainly hope so. It's definitely an achievable goal when you define it properly. And that's one of the things that uh, I hope you take away from this particular episode is that With the correct definition, most importantly, laboring under correct knowledge, many, if not all, of our goals become that much more achievable. Anyway, let's get back to it. Well, what I want to do, you know, so for example, let's say I've got, I'll just make up some from past clients. I'll just make up some scenarios, okay? Okay. So let's say I've got a really high earning attorney. Okay, the guy's making a bunch. He's got a very successful practice. And so I work with him, but he's renting his office space. And it's a large office space because it's a successful practice with a lot of employees. So I work with him on buying, you know, a, a fairly substantial office space of which he can at least take down all the rent if he has to off his own practice. And he can rent out other spaces in the meantime for additional cash flow. But if he gets in a bind, he has a problem with tenants, his practice will carry it, no problem. So now he's building equity into the office space, which ultimately will be a source for his retirement. And then he can sit there because his source of wealth is his practice, right? That's the source of wealth. Because um, you always have to identify when you're developing a wealth plan, you have to identify what the source of wealth is. It's a misnomer. Like People think it's about investing, and it's not. You have to first create the wealth, and then you have to invest the wealth. And actually, there's a third component between which is you have to translate the the wealth created, which is income initially, over to the asset side. So it's a three-part equation. You have to create the wealth in the first place. You have to translate the wealth over the asset side. And then you have to invest the wealth to grow in excess of inflation so that you increase purchasing power. So there's three components to it anyway. So I'm giving the example of the attorney. You know, we he he focuses on his practice. That's his wealth creation vehicle. We translate that over via real estate. That gives him increased deductions, yep. right? Yeah. And so he does that, and then he maxes out all his retirement plans for both him and his wife on the paper asset side. And he's good to go. That's all he needs to do. We don't, we don't have to get any more complicated. You contrast that with a school teacher. Okay, doesn't make even a fraction as much money, doesn't have the upside potential in income, and therefore he has to find his wealth creation somewhere else because basically his salary is lucky to pay his bills, right? Right. And so, but he maybe he's really great at home improvement skills and he actually really loves it. He's got two to three months off a year. And so maybe his goal is to create one rental house a year. And he maybe he gets the kind of junkier ones and he puts a lot of sweat labor into it, really makes them beautiful, fixes them up during that time off, and he builds equity that way. Got it. Makes perfect sense to me. Now, you said something really quickly that is a a topic I love to always ask questions about uh, because purchasing power and velocity of money are things that I'm always constantly running through my own head. So I would, you said, you got to grow the money in excess of the rate of inflation, which is great. However, how is someone to figure out what that number is in your opinion? The you mean the inflation rate? Inflation rate, and most importantly, how to exceed it is is I know the question someone is asking right now. That's that's why I'm asking yeah. you. Okay, so when you're looking at your wealth equation, there's there's really two components: your life cycle of wealth. In the early stages of wealth building, it's all about your savings rate is in relationship to your income. The higher your savings rate, the sooner you'll be financially independent. And it's a, it's it's a very straightforward equation. I have an article on my site called. Uh, how anyone can retire in 10 years or less. And in there, it goes through the math of the savings rate in relation to um, your income and your expenses. So that's pretty straight up math. And then the other side, the latter stages of your wealth equation is the um, return on investment net of inflation, which is the one you're referring to now. Now, when you look at that number inflation, it's almost funny because almost any financial advisor will just stick in 3%. Why do they choose that? Because that's been a historical rate of inflation over a very long period of time in the U.S. So the first thing you'll notice is several is several things. Are one, U.S.-centric data, right? Doesn't necessarily right. apply internationally. Doesn't mean that it's going to be true going forward because the U.S. was the economic prom queen of the world during the time period in which that data was created. We're like one of the only countries that didn't have a war on our soils. We didn't have major political upheaval, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so, plus we were the economic leader during that time period. Um, So 
that may not be data that's realistic to base it upon, but that's what they'll choose. They'll choose 3%. Now, you could range it up or range it down slightly depending on your assumptions, but the fact is we've had 10-year periods that are way higher in inflation than the 3%. And what you'll find when you really work with retirement calculations is it's the first, it's the 15 years pre- preceding your retirement and the 15 years after your return on investment during those two 15-year windows and they're two separate year 15-year windows. They're not a 30-year window because you have to get them both right. But your return on investment, net of inflation during those two periods pretty much determines your financial outcome. Interesting. I like that idea. It just – well, because that flies straight in the face of the idea of set it and forget it, that there's never that opportunity. Yeah. So here's a fun one for you. Think about in the rest of your life. Is there any point – so set it and forget it plays to the whole passive philosophy, right? Like you're just supposed to be passive about everything. Um, So there's passive investing as a philosophy. So if you think about it, where in your life do you have a process that's optimized through through a passive approach? You know, are your relationships optimized through a passive approach? (laughs) My wife says no. (laughs) <laughs> right. Laughable, right? right? Right. Raising raising your kids, is it optimized through a passive approach? Oh, Lord, no. Okay. Um, how about your health? Is that optimized through a passive approach? No. In fact, you got to imply more the older you get. Yeah. There's, there's no aspect of your life that is optimized through a passive approach. So what makes you think investing or wealth is going to be different? And I'm just glad you're willing to say it because I often tell people passive or passive income doesn't mean uninvolved. And that that's one of the first and, and cardinal mistakes that we could make from that idea. It's like, cool, I'll just buy a building and I don't have to worry about it. I'm like, no, you do. It doesn't work. Yeah, a, a building re- – Direct ownership of real estate, the way I teach it is there's a continuum of passive versus active. And every investment strategy, you can plot on that continuum. And so real estate's kind of a half and half. It's half business, half investment, right? So treasury bills is an example. That would be all the way over the far left as fully passive. Right. And to the far right as entrepreneurship, right? right? right. As, as fully active. But then you've got gradations in between. For instance, you can be an entrepreneur and build passive streams of income within your business. And so you can start tilting it to the left towards greater passivity. What I do, I have, I have, I hate to keep referring to the site, but these are all resources. I have another article called uh, Passive Income Hoax on my uh, website. And in that article, I talk about the difference between what we're just saying here, the passive versus active continuum, but also this idea of lag. You know, an active approach uh, to income can provide an immediate response, whereas uh, passive, usually it's a lagged response and you have to do the work up front to get paid down the road. But even then, there's some maintenance required to do it. And our websites are a great example, right? We can put a ton of work up front to build them. We're still going to have to work them down the road. You can't let them go passive or they die. Exactly. I mean, uh, as you know, and I know, when it comes to we, we think this is the way the website should be. And then traffic starts hitting it. And you're like, Oh, we have to change this and change this and make this better. All of those things are very, very true. Even if you're going to write a book, and that's going to be the way that you're going to do it. You still have to put the work out there to put the book together first, before you can go out there and sell and derive income from the asset that you just created. It, it, there's a lot of upfront work that is often not seen, not taught, and flies straight in the face of immediate gratification in all the ways, shapes, and forms. So, which gets me to this question. If someone was going to achieve, you know, this ability to retire, and regardless of the vehicle that they use, what would you say are the top three character traits that they must learn, develop, or already possess in order to be able to make it? Well, I'll narrow it down to one, commitment. Um, You have to be committed to the goal because everything in your life is going to compete with it. And so it won't happen unless you make it a priority. And that only happens if you're truly committed to it. So you have to, you know, here's a fun, fun equation for people to play with. You know how long it'll take you to reach your goal for um, retirement or passive income, income exceeds expenses, however you want to define it. Um, You know how long it'll take you by looking at the percentage of the amount of your uh, scarce resources, which is time and money that you dedicate to it. Wow. That tells you how long it'll take you to reach the goal. It's pretty simple because that's showing you your level of commitment. 
<laughs> well, I say right now you are hyper committed. So am I. And so are a number of you that are listening because uh, that should encourage you. Because uh, the more time you're you're headed in that direction, the more your mind and focus and you're out there building those assets and developing that real estate and doing the things that are required. So let me ask the exact inverse of that question. What would you say is the number one thing that you've seen your clients struggle with that get in the way that just take them off track and they just like never return? Oh, see that now that's funny because you go mirror image and I go mirror image in my answer. Let me count the ways, right? <laughs> there, there are so many. Um, one of them obviously is distraction, right? They allow themselves to be distracted. That would be the mirror image of commitment. Um, confusing objectives. So, you know, as you pointed out earlier, you said something about delayed gratification. That's a characteristic of successful wealth builders. And I'm not even really comfortable with that term delayed gratification because I think I really think of it as getting a different form of gratification. You know, when I was saving uh, very aggressively, I didn't view it as delayed gratification. I was very gratified by what I was doing because I was moving towards my goals. I so like to me, that. it was yeah. So you're you're you know you're dedicating your resources to where you want to go. So it's a very positive or you know, offense thing as opposed to defense. Um, so clarity around the goals. I see a lot of people, you know, they'll come and they'll say, oh, I want to be uh, rich. I want to be financially independent. Oh, really? How come? You know, oh, you know, they want a Lamborghini or they want this or they want that. And that kind of a goal will keep you from actually getting your financial independence goal because the true, the driving motivation I've seen that drives successful financial independence is when you prioritize experiences over stuff. And there's a reason for that. If you want stuff really bad, if that's your really driving motivation is stuff, then what happens is you will raise your lifestyle to acquire the stuff as soon as you have the money to afford to do it. And that'll keep you from building the equity and the assets, which ultimately is what drives financial independence. You know, um, I, I've got to, I got to confess here, Todd. I, um, at one time I, I, I wanted a Lamborghini until I realized I couldn't fit in it. That was, that was the whole thing. I, I went I went to the dealership and everything. I tried to get in one and it just didn't work out. They're not made for six foot four people. That's <laughs> they're just not. So that killed it for me and made it made it much simpler. Uh but I like your idea of stress on the experiences. And when you say experiences, what are you or is this like the 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 hiking thing, the two hundred and fifty mile uh hiking thing that you're referring to? Yeah, you think what does it really take to be happy? Right. I mean, like I'm actually a, a fairly simple guy in terms of what my needs are. It's really healthy food, clean water, comfortable bed, a good chair to sit and read in and a great book and time to enjoy my life. I'm a very much outdoor recreation guy, but once you have the toys, it doesn't cost that much to enjoy those things. Um, it's just, you know, it's not that complicated. I, we, we make it really complicated, but it's not that complicated. And it's anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> got it. He's like, it, it's not that complicated. Don't complicate. Yeah, it. it's just it, it's experiences. You know, I, I you think about it, what's going to make for a satisfying day today. What, what's going to make you for a happy day today? It's got it, got it. So let's talk about this though. You mentioned treasuries earlier and the passive ideas, and we understand that real estate's in the middle. For most... oh, here I'll, I'm going to throw something in, Jay. I want to I want to throw something in on that because I didn't explain that very well. Okay. There's a fun phenomenon you'll see with people as they build wealth, and maybe you've seen it with people you talk with, which is when they have enough money to afford anything, they usually remark that there's not much they want. That the wants are actually a result of the scarcity mindset that comes from not being able to afford it in the first place. Once you can afford it, it usually isn't all that enticing. Yeah, that's that's kind of true. There have been many times, for me, many of you guys know, I, I live in the Apple store for no particular reason other than I like to go there for inspiration. Uh, as And you can just, there are times I can remember going to many different stores and just thinking, yeah, there's nothing in here that I really need uh, anymore. I'm, I'm pretty good. It's, it's, it's an interesting way to live. But let me ask you this question. Is there... How is one to determine, in your opinion, like if, if I'm listening to you for the first time right now and I'm going, okay, Todd, I believe you, I got to do some stuff, I've got, I, I, I want to be on this path, 
Is there a particular path that you've seen work more frequently than others? And if so, how can I find out if I'm fit for that particular path? Hey, can you say that question? I just realized an answer to the earlier question you did where I did a big breath and I couldn't give you a good answer. Okay. When you, when you asked how much money do you need to retire, I realized what the good answer would be. So it's when your investments provide cash flow in excess of expenses. Mm-hmm. And so it gets away from the asset-based one, right? Because it could be real estate, it could be dividends, stocks, whatever. When your investments are throwing off cash flow in excess of expenses, then you're quote-unquote retired. So it's not about how much money, it's about how much cash flow it's producing, right? Indeed. And then, and then the other simple answer, I'm trying to give soundbite simple answers to the question. The other simple answer, if you're looking at it from a traditional paper asset side, is there's the rule of 300 or the rule of 400. And that comes from the 3% rule and the 4% rule, which is research that stemmed, uh, it's on US data and it's based on work by um, um, Bangan. And it, it's, it's well known. And so he came up with the 4% rule, which was an amount you can withdraw from assets that survives all 30 year periods. And a conservative version of that is the 3% rule. So if you figure the, you know, the reciprocal of that is 25 times assets and then 12 months. So it's basically for every thousand dollars that you spend in expenses per month, it requires about $300,000 in assets. And that would be, and then the conservative version is about $400,000 in assets. Got it. That, that, and again, that, which with the leverage that you can use to go out there and purchase real estate is an easier way to hit those numbers, especially if you get the amortizing kind of debt. Yeah, but again, we're talking about assets, not, you know, so that would be equity. And well, I, the, yeah. the asset side was strictly, the, the asset side was strictly from the paper asset world. Got it. You know, when you quit it, when you quit it to real estate, you really have to boil it down to cash flow. You can't boil it down to assets because you're never spending any principal. You know, you can only, right. you don't want to spend the the roof tiles, you know, you've got to, <laughs> you, you can only spend the the income that it throws off. So the real estate side is really simple. It's cash flow exceeds expenses. On the paper asset side, it's more complicated. So I'm giving a rule of thumb. It's a decent approximation. Um, it's not for sure, but it points you true north. It puts you in the ballpark at least. Got it. So with all that being the case, what do you, is there a path that you find to be the easiest for most people? most accessible? No. I mean, is there any no. advantage? How, do, how does one know? Do, you know? do I do the paper asset thing? Do I do the real estate thing? Do I do the business thing? How, how, how does one make that decision? Well, I, t- I touched on that when we were talking about wealth plans earlier, and I was saying it's unique to each person. So what is the easiest path for Jay Massey is different from the easiest path for Todd Dresseter. Um, it depends on the skills and resources and abilities you bring to the equation and what your goals are and what you want to do with your life. And so it's just different. You can't, you can't pull up the easiest path. There is no simple superlative answer like that. There are paths that statistically have a higher uh, incidence of putting you in the wealthy category, right? So statistically, uh, entrepreneurship, business ownership, and um, real estate are the, the paths that have the most people build wealth. Um, that, that's how most people end up in the wealthy category. But Paper assets exist. It's a viable alternative. Some people might say, oh, Warren Buffett, you know, paper assets, but really Warren Buffett owned companies uh, of which right. those paper assets were wrapped inside an insurance umbrella through through his insurance companies, Berkshire Hathaway and so on. Um, so it's, you know, again, business and real estate is generally where most of the wealth gets built. Understood. Totally understood. Now, what about those individuals right now listening who might feel a little bit behind the gun? They're like, yeah, all this sounds great, but I'm out of time. How do, you know, it, it, that's, you know, I, I, retirement's five years, six years, seven years away is when I was planning on doing this. Is, is, there, is there any hope, Todd, for them? Well, there is, but you have to be realistic. You're not going to do it through saving your way to wealth. If you didn't, if you didn't start saving long ago, you're not going to suddenly convert and save 90% of your income. Um, so (laughs) that's true. Right. So you have to kind of throw that one out the window and say the slow path or the saving and passive path is, is pretty much done for you because you waited too long. Um, so that's left with real estate and paper assets and even real estate is kind of halfway, I'm sorry, real estate and business ownership and even real estate's kind of halfway in between. If somebody was in that situation, I'd really be prompting them for, what business ideas do they really have? What would get them juiced from a business development side? Because even though it's the least certain 
in terms of success. It has the highest leverage. And the other thing that's really cool about business entrepreneurship is you can convert it into passive revenue streams relatively quickly. And so if you have to replace a few thousand in income to be financially independent relatively short period of time, typically business is going to be your fastest path. Now, you mentioned something that I think is a very important point. Uh, oftentimes, we talk about trying to save this stack of, sta- uh, stack of cash, this pile of cash. And I'm saying, no, we need streams of cash. We've got to convert those stacks into streams. If you would, please, you said it really fast. You've got to take that business and you can convert it into the stream. I'd love to know, how is one to do that? In your, from your perspective? Well, why don't we use my business as an example? So I have a certain number of visitors and there's certain revenue streams. So there's advertising, there's uh, affiliate programs, there's my books, there's my coaching, and there's um, going to be the membership site coming up. And so certain ones of those can be passive and other ones are trading time for money. So like the coaching is a trading time for money. So that one won't convert although that was certainly the quickest revenue stream to create in the business. Um, The advertising is completely passive. The books are semi-passive. I do have to write them, and the more I continue to write, the more all of them sell. And so for me, let's say, if I wanted to take this thing to passive in a period of years, I would focus on traffic increases, which convert on advertising. I would add a few more books, and that would do it. You know, and then in terms – so I would focus on the product side, which can be – more passive than the service side. Indeed. And it sounds as though that there's levels of systems that come into play to help facilitate that as well. Absolutely. Got it. Got it. Totally understood. Excellent. So at this point, if their brain isn't full, for those that want to go and find out more about what you're up to and how you can help, what would be their best course of action? You mean in in terms of next steps with me? Yeah, absolutely. They're probably wanting to track you down because if if they're anything like me right now, they've heard so many things. They're like, yeah, I want to read that article. Yeah, I want to know more about that. And what's he think about this? How can they find that information? So the site, my site is financialmentor.com. And it's again, financialmentor.com. And, you know, I don't have anything to pitch you. So there's a free opt-in list and I give away a thing. It's called the Wealth Building Toolbox. And in there is an ebook, 18 Essential Lessons of a Self-Made Millionaire. And it tells my story and a lot of the lessons along the way, a lot of stuff we talked about here and a lot more. And then also I have a 52-week course called 52 Weeks to Financial Freedom. And no, you won't get wealthy in 52 weeks, but it'll cover a lot of the core principles. And all that's free. So it's not even being sold to you. It's all free stuff you get for just opting in. Awesome. Excellent. Now, for that person or persons listening right now who are thinking to themselves, I want to be the superhero. I want to finally go get on my cape and start becoming this entrepreneur and building cash flow and doing these things that these guys talk about. But they're feeling a little nervous. You know, can I do it? Is it right for me? How how on earth is all this going to happen? Is this really going to work? What would you say to that person? Well, yes, it does work. Um, is it a, a sterile, safe process? No. Uh, will you take your lumps? Absolutely, yes. Um, but if you want it, you can get it. You just have to be dedicated to it and willing to get back up every time you get knocked back down and, and pursue it. You want to work on a couple levels. You want to work on a smart, strategic wealth plan so that you know it's based on sound principles. And if you take these actions, if you take X actions, you get Y result. And so that's built into your wealth plan. So you've got to get that. And then um, you've got to be willing to take action. You know, it's, it's a combination of having a plan that governs your action and then taking consistent, methodical, strategic action towards the set goals and just going, going, going relentlessly until you get there. I like it a lot. Well, one of the things I want to say is thank you for taking the time to make an investment here with us at the Cashflow Diary. Hey, thanks for having me, Jay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what it's time to do? It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean today? It means go over to Financial Mentor. Just go. 
Because you heard it just like I heard. There was so many resources on the site. Financialmentor.com is there for you, and so much of it costs nothing but time. One of those very valuable and scarce resources. You probably even should pick up a number of his books. And most importantly, you also heard the resource, The War of Art and Do the Work uh, by Stephen Pressfield. Here's the point. You've got no excuse from this episode of what you should do next. If there's something that you heard mentioned that you haven't yet done, that's a clue to get out there and go make it happen. It's been fun talking to you guys today, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time. <laughs>